So let me first uh, s say how I uh, suggest to structure uh, my um, presentation, introductory uh, exposition, if I may. First, I would like to say a word on uh, my understanding of the unconventional monetary policies, which have been uh, uh, very, very popular uh, in the crisis because of the crisis, uh, are not the same in all uh, uh, countries, economies, and the central banks, but, uh, but uh, need to perhaps <coughs> understand a little bit better. And some of the papers I have uh, circulated in advance uh, are uh, elaborating a little bit on this, uh, I would say, multidimensionality of the uh, unconventional monetary policy. Uh, but in the limited uh, time we have, consider that I will go through um, titles of chapter and uh, uh, feel absolutely free to ask, of course, uh, any questions um, after I will have the uh, response of the uh, moderators. Uh, second, I would like to say a word on um, uh, a number of uh, elements that I interpret myself as uh, suggesting that there is a convergence uh, not only uh, between uh, the monetary policies of the central banks but also in many other dimensions of the activity uh, responsibilities of the central banks that I consider uh, are very much or were very much triggered by the crisis are probably uh, durable, will last uh, longer than uh, the crisis period and are quite interesting in terms of uh, evolution of central banking uh, in the advanced economy. Then I would uh, like to say a word on the euro because I participated very actively in the setting up of the euro in its ne negotiation of the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, I was president of the ECB as uh, was just said and uh, I think that uh, it would be good to elaborate a little bit on what I would uh, qualify as the success of the euro, obviously. And then, uh, last point I would like to embark on would uh, only be to reflect on future measures uh, that uh, would be, in my view, appropriate if we want uh, EMU to function better, uh, the single currency uh, economy to function better uh, in many of the uh, possible dimensions. So I will not elaborate on the other dimension of uh, European unity, uh, but on specifically EMU, including what I had recommended at a certain time, uh, namely the capacity to, to simulate a fiscal federation by exception in some cases, but I, I'll try to to be as uh, comprehensive as I can in uh, this uh, dimension of improving the functioning of EMU. So let me start with the, the first point. I think it is uh, something which uh, is not necessarily very well uh, understood that the uh, policies, the monetary policies that we are uh, qualifying uh, unconventional have uh, multiple uh, targets, if I may. When you look, of course, from now on to what has happened uh, since the burst of the crisis in uh, 07, 08, 10, 11, and, and uh, the following years, uh, the idea was uh, very much that uh, what we call unconventional, namely uh, the purchase of a uh, treasuries, the purchase of uh, credible uh, private securities, the forward guidance uh, also, and uh, a number of other points uh, uh, which are in the category of unconventional, including the full allotment at fixed rate, which was the, uh, I would say, um, the main instrument uh, utilized in Europe at the very beginning. All this in the present understanding by uh, what I would probably qualify the mainstream of the analysis is that it is because we were in exceptional circumstances, the uh, interest rates were going very rapidly to zero, the zero lower bond of interest rates was, were, was calling for other monetary policy instruments and these instruments were precisely mainly 
say QE to oversimplify massive purchase of tradable securities in order even when you were at the level of zero as regards the interest rates uh, decided by the central bank to have the possibility of uh, uh, I would say carving all the yield curve and have medium and long term rates also be as low as possible uh, so not relying upon the normal transmission of the uh, decision-making process of the central bank touching only the very short term, I would say uh, the, the shorter term uh, part of the uh, yield curve, but to carve, as I said, the yield curve in order to have as low as possible all the interest rates. So the term premium would be as low as possible thanks to this uh, massive purchase of securities. I take it that this is true, of course, this is one of the observations which uh, is perfectly legitimate, even if we know now that we can go even below uh, the zero lower bond as regards the, uh, the short-term uh, interest rates, as was demonstrated by uh, the ECB, by the uh, Bank of Japan, by uh, the Bank of uh, Switzerland, by Bank of Sweden, and so forth. So you, we have a number of examples showing that uh, we could be lower for the shorter term rates than zero. Still, it remains perfectly uh, appropriate to suggest that at a certain time when you cannot go uh, more down in terms of short term rates, you have to rely upon other instruments. So that's for one. This, it is undoubtedly one of the goals. But to me, it is not uh, covering uh, all the dimension of uh, uh, the, uh, I would say, unconventional uh, monetary policy. You have also other elements which are also of some importance. By the way, I am moving permanently. I don't know. It's not a problem for you. Okay, fine. Um, so, uh, another goal, clearly, uh, which was absolutely explicitly mentioned both in the US and in Europe, and also before in Japan, is to simply counter a dramatic succession of events, the unfolding of a financial crisis of major dimension uh, with an element of uh, disruption that could be totally dramatic, both, I would say, financially and uh, economically. And that is perfectly in line with what we observed at the very beginning of the crisis uh, in uh, <coughs> 2007, for instance, when the interest rates uh, in Europe were at a level which had nothing to do with 0%, we decided for the third time, the 9th of August 2007, to embark on unlimited supply of liquidity at fixed rate. We were asked this very day, this very morning, something like 95 billion euros of liquidity by all the uh, <coughs> market in uh, the euro area. We delivered the 95 billion, which was an enormous amount of liquidity, totally unexpected, totally unexpected in Europe, totally unexpected in the world, in order to, for the ECB and the European to maintain control of the functioning of their money market at a moment where, because of the subprime crisis, there was a total evaporation of liquidity on the market and we had no control of our market. So this is an example of a highly unconventional measures. We never had taken such a measure before, but in the heat, in the dram drama of this uh, unfolding of uh, the cr that, I would say, component of the crisis, we decided again to be as imaginative and creative and also as bold and as swift as possible. This is, again, one, one example which I take it as unconventional measures, uh, targeting explicitly the goal of countering a dramatic crisis which was unfolding. So the same in the US after the Lehman Brothers crisis, same in the US and in the other uh, advanced economy, uh, we had to embark on uh, extremely bold measures also, and in the US and in Europe, it was not exactly at the very beginning the same kind of unconventional measures. I already uh, spoke in Europe of the uh, 
illimited supply of liquidity at fixed rate, full allotment at fixed rate, uh, the generalization of the full allotment at fixed rate, which still exists in Europe at the moment I am speaking, showing to which extent it is a, a weapon that was uh, that proved very, very important. But uh, that the generalization is uh, uh, was uh, was a decision taken by me and my colleagues uh, at the moment where we had to cope with the Lehman Brothers crisis. So full generalization of illimited supply of liquidity at fixed rate. Another, of course, very important element of the countering of the crisis was in the US the uh, purchase of uh, uh, tradable securities on the secondary market. And uh, that was explicitly mentioned as a way to counter the uh, crisis which was unfolding in situations which were very, very dramatic. That, that's what I would say the, another goal of the uh, unconventional measure. And um, of course, uh, in our own case, uh, as uh, to the extent that we had to cope with first the subprime crisis, I already mentioned the 9 of August 2007 as a very important moment for us in, the, in Europe. Then we had to cope with the Lehman Brothers uh, bankruptcy. Uh, I, I would only mention for that episode in the crisis that there was no Lehman Brothers in Europe. And uh, I could respond to questions on the, on, on, uh, of the kind of why uh, did, did the European not had such um, a dramatic uh, episode of Lehman Brothers? It's very, very uh, uh, simple to explain uh, because we did everything to avoid that and to avoid a, a new drama uh, in, uh, in Europe after the drama that uh, had occurred in the United States of America. But it, it was very difficult. It was uh, extremely complex. And it called uh, for a um, strong mobilization of the central bank. And also, uh, I would say, uh, an accord of all the uh, democracies uh, concerned, the um, executive branches, to accept, to take risks in order to avoid uh, the explosion of uh, 40s uh, in, uh, in Belgium, uh, of a uh, number of uh, Ipo real estate in Germany and, and, and. so all, all the banks uh, in, uh, in um, Ireland. Not to speak, of course, of the problem of London. London, I don't cover London uh, because uh, they are not member, they were not and are not member of the EMU and of the single currency. Still, of course, the same crisis was uh, uh, dramatically hitting all marketplaces and all European countries without exception. And in all cases, very bold decisions had to be taken, including uh, in some cases, including in the UK, nationalization of uh, enormous uh, commercial banks. So all this only to, to mention that when we had the third episode of the crisis ourselves in Europe, which was the sovereign risk crisis, uh, starting in uh, 2009, 2010, 2011, and continuing uh, over time, then uh, again, we had to uh, utilize the unconventional measures, uh, as uh, I said, to counter a crisis at its very beginning. And the unconventional measures which was taken at the time was in particular the purchase of tradable uh, securities, namely the uh, uh, treasuries of Ireland, Portugal, uh, and Greece, of course, which is a case in point, in uh, 2010, and to purchase also treasuries of Spain and Italy in uh, 2011. So as you see, extraordinary bold measures, because it was not uh, done before, of course, to target precisely a certain number of uh, tradable securities with a view to counter the uh, unfolding of the crisis in the five countries I have been mentioning. Uh, so <coughs> that is clear. It is documented. You can see uh, that this goal, countering uh, the unfolding of a crisis, 
was uh, very clearly uh, a major goal of unconventional measures. There is a third one, which I mentioned because I take it that it is very important to understand fully. Uh, and that third dimension of unconventional measures would be when you are in a situation which is clearly abnormal. Not abnormal because you are necessarily at zero rates or negative rates, not abnormal because you are uh, countering the unfolding of a dramatic crisis, but because the private sector does not function normally. Because you cannot count only on the decision, decentralized decision of uh, private entities, investors, savers, uh, financial institutions, to make the market function as correctly as possible, particular, particularly the money market. And that calls for a third dimension of uh, the unconventional measures, which would be for the central bank to substitute, not necessarily totally, but substitute totally or partially uh, to uh, the, uh, I would say, failing uh, private uh, entities, private uh, market participants. Um, and uh, that is very clear when you look at, uh, for instance, take, take the United States of America. Uh, they, had, uh, they are now in a situation where they have <coughs> augmented, not considerably, but significantly, their interest rates. Still, they look very carefully at the level of the uh, overall uh, uh, volume of uh, the balance sheet of the uh, central bank. And uh, they clearly, through the present volume of the balance sheet of the central bank, which is, as you know, slightly diminishing in the present period, but there are some meditation on whether or not it would not be wise to stop the slight diminishing of the volume of this, uh, of this uh, outstanding tradable securities in their balance sheet. Uh, there was also a meditation on whether it was appropriate or not to maintain the volume during a certain period of time at uh, the level where it was. It is, as you know, <coughs> it will be the, the case in Europe from now on. The uh, uh, QE has stopped in, uh, algebraically, algebraically in uh, terms of augmenting the volume of the outstanding tradable securities. But the volume is supposed to be maintained. And there you see that the judgment which is made by the central bank's concern is that the, 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 the overall, I would say, uh, money market, your overall functioning of uh, the uh, financial system is such that some help coming from the central bank is still necessary. And I could elaborate more on uh, other instruments that uh, might be utilized in order with, the, with this view that uh, uh, they have, we have, we central bank have to again substitute partially to a market which is spontaneously not behaving uh, properly. So that's for the multidimensionality of the goals. And in the papers I have uh, been circulating, you see that I am mentioning a number of declarations that are interesting because at the very beginning, in particular, of uh, the crisis, uh, Ben, my uh, friend on the other side of the Atlantic, or uh, Don Con, uh, had a reflection making very clearly the difference uh, between uh, what they would call at the time full QE or equivalent of QE and what they were doing, which they did not consider as fully, uh, fully uh, equivalent to QE. Then, as I already said, when the interest rates were at a very low level or zero level, we had a different uh, interpretation, dominant in interpretation, which was legitimate, but had more or less erased uh, the uh, other goals I have been mentioning. Now, let me say just a few words on the uh, multidimensionality of the instruments concerned. It might be interesting because there uh, we can see a little bit better why uh, you have uh, a difference in the utilization of these uh, various instruments on, the, on both sides of the Atlantic. 
The main, uh, I would say, observation I would, uh, I would make is that we have a big difference between the US and uh, the euro area economy. Uh, in the US, the financing of the uh, economy is made in the proportion of around, I would say, 75%. Was made, because, because it is changing on both sides of the Atlantic, but was 75% uh, financing through markets for, for many reasons, including the fact that you have Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae in the United States of America, which are playing a very important role. 75 markets, 25 commercial banks. That was the proportion for the financing of the US. On this side of the Atlantic, it was exactly the, the reverse. It was 75 banks and 25 markets. And that explains why the US concentrated very, the Fed concentrated very, very much uh, in uh, the, on the uh, overall uh, purchase of um, securities, tradable securities. The main problem for the United States uh, was the evaporation of the liquidity on the markets. Th those 75% uh, uh, channel uh, to finance the economy. And so the drama would have been a, stop, a sudden stop of the functioning of markets. And again, uh, the, the way a central bank has to give liquidity to market is certainly to go on the secondary market and to purchase tradable securities. In our case, 75% banks, the main problem for us was the interruption of the functioning of the banks and the, of the banking uh, fu functioning, uh, financing of the economy. And that's the reason why we concentrated very, very much on the banks, namely with this illimited supply of liquidity at fixed rate. For, for the US, they, ex they were exerting maximum pressure on the markets, and through the markets, they were uh, giving liquidity, sufficient liquidity, for that liquidity to uh, go all over the, uh, I would say, economy of the United States. In our case, we were making sure that there was not a single, uh, a normal single bank. Of course, uh, you have the special case of those banks that had major individual difficulty, but the idea was for a, a normal bank, it, we take into account the fact that the, the money market is not functioning correctly, so it could be that that bank has no access to liquidity, but to, be, to make absolutely sure that they all have the liquidity they would like, we ask them to only say which liquidity they want. Of course, provided they have the collateral uh, that would uh, guarantee the central bank that uh, there are appropriate guarantees. But uh, to the extent that the guarantees were presented by the commercial bank, then we would, uh, we would accept to give exactly the level of liquidity they were asking for. So we were making absolutely sure that we would not have, as I said already, evaporation of liquidity in the, uh, in the commercial bank constituencies. And uh, that was something which functioned quite correctly, so correctly, by the way, that it still functioned presently. It is a good example of uh, what I was uh, mentioning as uh, the goal, which is to substitute partially to a private economy which uh, is not functioning spontaneously correctly. But again, you see two very different universes on both sides of the Atlantic, with a special dedication in one case on uh, purchase of uh, tradable securities uh, at uh, the very, very beginning. Even if it was not qualified QE, you might remember that QE was it's a qualification which was given by the market, not by the central bank. Uh, uh, at the moment of a new decision was taken, which was called by market QE2, which was supposing that there had been a QE1, which was never advocated by the, uh, by the Federal Reserve because they were in a different conceptual universe at the very moment when they were taking those decisions. Now, another example of uh, uh, something which is original and uh, is uh, uh, European, if I may, in its uh, originality, is the OMT. OMT is in the category of off-balance sheet commitment. 
taken by the ECB, exactly like a full allotment at fixed rate, is an off-balance sheet commitment. We don't know uh, in advance what is the amount of liquidity that would be asked by the various commercial banks. It could be a trillion euro more than what they had asked uh, uh, before, or uh, two trillion more. I mean, it's a very, very uh, important off-balance sheet commitment. OMT, you remember, is also an off-balance sheet commitment which was never utilized, but still exists and uh, was introduced in uh, 2012 after the purchase, targeted purchase of uh, tradable securities, treasuries, that we call SMP. The SMP program was a program to counter the uh, expansion of the crisis to, as I already mentioned, five countries in Europe in uh, 10 and 11. Uh, OMT, at a moment where you had resurgence of uh, such, uh, uh, I would say, uh, threats of, uh, of a crisis, we had uh, the decision by the ECB to say, if we have a situation which is uh, very bad for any particular country, and provided, of course, that country takes uh, decisions that would uh, be credible in terms of uh, going back to a more normal situation and a credible uh, situation permitting the signature of the country to be creditworthy, then the central bank could mobilize itself and do exactly what had been done with the program SMP. The program SMP was a real one with real purchase of, uh, of uh, treasuries uh, on the secondary market. The OMT program was a promise to act in certain circumstances. Uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, unconventional measures were not, uh, are not taken, were not taken in the US. There is no such, I would say, off-balance sheet commitment uh, in, uh, in the Fed uh, weaponry in comparison with what, uh, what has been done in Europe. So I mentioned uh, those because I, I take it that it is, it is interesting to see that uh, uh, the weaponry of the unconventional measures has to be adapted to uh, the situation, the structural situation in which your economy is situated. I take it, uh, of course, because it's easy, the examples of the Federal Reserve and the example of, uh, of the Euro area uh, for reasons that are, um, that are obvious, uh, because, uh, may, but, but I could apply that to other central banks. What can I say? Uh, I, um, I uh, spoke of the multidimensionality of objective, the multidimensionality of uh, the instruments, purchase of securities. Of course, as uh, the most of uh, my, um, my um, mention of uh, purchase of securities was purchase of treasuries, of, uh, of uh, public securities, if I may. But uh, we intervened on both sides of the Atlantic also with uh, the uh, private securities. Uh, in my time, uh, we embarked on the uh, purchase of uh, covered bonds in, uh, in Europe. In the US, they were intervening very largely on a very large spectrum of uh, public and private securities. And of course, you can refine that uh, in terms of uh, trying to target uh, not only the uh, overall level in the yield curve, of the benchmark, which is the treasuries, with a special dedication for shorter, uh, shorter term, medium term, five years, 10 years. I mean, you, you have all the possibilities to try again to target uh, uh, all the yield curve. You can also target the uh, overall uh, uh, spreads between the benchmark, namely the treasuries, and the private uh, interest rates, uh, and then you, ta you, you purchase uh, such and such category of uh, private rates. So I don't elaborate much more on that, but I uh, draw your attention on the main message. Don't, don't arrest yourself in your meditation on what has happened in the crisis and what still is utilized. Don't uh, stop yourself in your meditation uh, upon the idea that it's very simple when you are at zero rates you purchase uh, massively uh, tradable securities, and that, that, that is as simple as that. No, it's more complicated, more complex, and as I said already, more multidimensional. 
Now, let me uh, confirm that these are titles for questions, so you do. Uh, you, you, you will ask a lot of questions, I, I expect, and of course in the documents you have, uh, you will see, uh, you have a, a number of other important uh, uh, issues that we could elaborate together upon. So la now let me uh, go on this idea of convergence. Uh, I must confess I didn't see much in the literature these, uh, these ideas of uh, the emergence of a conceptual convergence. Uh, that uh, I take it, uh, I observe myself when, uh, when I was uh, president, and uh, I was quite, uh, quite surprised by the fact that uh, whilst being in very different situations with uh, legislation that was very, very different from uh, country to country or from continent to continent, uh, or uh, uh, I would say, uh, whilst having a history that were not the same at all, and, um, and uh, for us, in our particular case, a very short period of existence. Huh? Because remember, the euro starts first the January 99, and we had the crisis already in 07. So we, we were an extremely young currency and an extremely young institution when uh, we have to, to cope, cope with this uh, dramatic crisis, which, by the way, was the worst and the most dramatic crisis since World War II. And in my opinion, could have been the worst financial crisis since World War I. Uh, had we not been able to cope with the crisis, also at uh, the very beginning of the crisis, with bold and swift measures coming from central banks and from governments. But uh, let me elaborate a little bit, and again, consider that these are titles of uh, cha possible chapters. I see perhaps six issues, six dimensions, where one can say there is a very, very extraordinary phenomenon of convergence uh, between the various central banks. Let me concentrate first on the uh, non-core non monetary policy uh, elements in this convergence. The idea that in the crisis, because all our fellow citizens were in a situation which was very dramatic, all central banks of the advanced economy, uh, don't forget we are speaking of a crisis of the advanced economies and not a crisis of the emerging economies, but all all the central banks in the advanced economy decided spontaneously, without any kind of, uh, I would say, collegial decision, but decided to improve their communication with all market participants, but also with their fellow citizens. And um, uh, the idea that uh, uh, s press conferences had to be organized, and I participated myself, all taken into account in my eight years of uh, mandate, in 88 press conferences with uh, all the TV camera and uh, press conference, which for a central bank like uh, the Fed or the central bank like the ECB, are global press conferences, not, not only European, but global. But the target was, of course, as I said, the uh, European citizens member of the euro area. So it was very interesting for me, which uh, was practicing the press conference before the crisis, because in our own case in the euro area, it was absolutely necessary because we had um, 12, uh, 11, 12, uh, and then um, 17 and 19 countries that were member of the euro area with various languages. So it was very, very important to avoid to take a decision in the uh, governing council that would be communicated by many voices with the risk of being all translated in English and then, of course, with error of translation or mistakes of translation or difference in translation that would create a cacophony which would have been abominable. So we were bound ourselves from the very beginning only for that, uh, for that uh, reason to have a single voice 
and the single voice was the voice of the president. The president was expressing himself. I'm sad to say that, but in English. <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, the terms of reference were the same by definition for uh, all, I would say, uh, those who had an interest in understanding what the decision was. So again, when the crisis erupted, it was our own way of communicating, mainly through uh, press conferences to explain immediately in real time what was the essence, the thrust of the decision that had been taken and what was the goal and how we saw things and so forth. Not only with the, an introductory exposition that would be as clear as possible, but also through question and answers. The US decided to embark on press conferences. They did not exist before the crisis. In the crisis, and because of the crisis, the Federal Reserve decided to have press conferences. And the same in the UK, the same uh, in Japan, and the same in all advanced economies that, that had to cope with this exceptional situation. So uh, have in mind that communication, which is a very, very important part, of course, of... Uh, 35 minutes. 35. I, I have still 35 minutes? No, you are at <laughs> Okay, okay. So thank you very much. It's very useful. Very important information. German so Pardon? Yeah, yeah. But I, I count very much on the German wisdom. <laughs> so, uh, so this is important. And this is, in my understanding, clearly a consequence <coughs> of the uh, dramatic episode that we had to cope with. Another element, a second element, say, was that we were uh, discovering the importance of systemic risk, of uh, systemic uh, uh, element that the central bank had to examine very carefully, not only price stability, but financial stability, systemic risk. And across the Atlantic, and uh, uh, I would say everywhere in the advanced economy, with different format, you had the creation of entities that were specialized in the risk assessment where the central banks were playing a very important role. In our own case in Europe, it is the, uh, the uh, uh, presidency given to the ECB and the secretariat given to the ECB for the European risk assessment and uh, that that is something which uh, which is very important but you have the same kind of institution on in the united states even if the federal reserve does not preside over over uh, and it is the the treasury the secretary of the treasury that is presiding over but reflect on that there was a convergence of assessment considering that the location close to the central bank or in the central bank of this assessment of uh, systemic risk and more generally of the uh, responsibility of uh, having financial stability as an important, not necessarily the major responsibility of the central bank, but certainly an important responsibility with price stability is something which uh, has been generalized also at that time. Another element I would also like to mention, which is more impressive, is that the mainstream now in all over the world in the uh, advanced economy, with the sole exception, I would say, of major exception of Japan, is that it is right to give the central bank a major responsibility in banking surveillance. We were totally divided before the crisis. You had uh, uh, several schools. One school, uh, wh which was uh, quite dominant, if I may, in some respect, was that you should strictly separate the central bank responsibility of price stability and the uh, surveillance of uh, banks and uh, surveillance of their uh, compliance with the uh, overall uh, rules and uh, prudentials and so forth. Uh, and then you had two separate institutions with the ID, you should not mix the two responsibility. In the crisis, because of the crisis, because of all the lessons learned in all countries, this ID was totally changed. 
the UK, which was the champion of the idea of separating the central bank from the uh, financial authority, the FSA, uh, decided to eliminate the FSA or to put the FSA under the umbrella of the central bank, say. In Europe, as you know, a major decision was taken to create a banking union and to give the ultimate responsibility of banking surveillance to the central bank. Uh, it, it was an immense decision in Europe because you had in Europe, in the euro area, the two schools with uh, Germany being a little bit in between uh, in the two schools so that the, the Bundesbank would play a role but not the final decision. Some, in some countries, the final decision uh, was very close to the central bank. In others, it was totally separated, like in the United Kingdom. But now, you see, uh, United Kingdom uh, has decided to join the school of those who put a very important responsibility in the central bank. Uh, the ECB is the ultimate uh, responsible for her uh, for banking surveillance, and the, the US has always considered that the um, central bank had a, an important responsibility in this domain too. And so we we are in a situation which, from that standpoint, is totally different from the situation that we had before the crisis. Another element of convergence, which I take it as a very very important one, as regards the overall. Uh, uh, core of, uh, as I said, of the uh, uh, monetary policy, and there you have several elements that could be mentioned. Uh, one, of course, is the fact that uh, we all agree now that uh, to take decisions uh, on monetary policy, it is necessary to have a view of what's happening in terms of uh, evolution of component and uh, counterpart of the monetary aggregates. That was totally disputed before the crisis. The idea of uh, the, target, uh, the inflation targeting was considering that only, uh, I would say, economic analysis could guide or should guide the decision of the central bank. We considered in uh, the case of uh, of uh, the ECB, that you could have uh, both, I would say, an economic analysis and also a monetary analysis. By monetary analysis, we, me we were meaning an analysis of the dynamics of the, mainly the dynamics of the component and the counterpart of the overall monetary aggregate. And of course, one of very important counterpart being the uh, outstanding debt uh, both, I would say, for, uh, for the private sector and the public sector. And uh, we uh, were in a situation where, again, we were stretched between our own school, which was a minority school. Uh, yeah, there were not, not many uh, support in uh, academia for uh, what uh, the ECB was suggesting. And the, the mainstream school, which was the inflation targeting with only economic analysis. Now, there, it's not disputed that it is necessary to look at everything. Uh, that is, of course, a, a major lesson of the crisis, that uh, the central bank should look also at what's happening in terms of potential financial instability, in terms of the dynamics of the, uh, uh, of the credit in particular. And you see a link, of course, between this change of the concept of mon monetary policy and also the other element which are uh, also very, very important, uh, systemic risk and banking surveillance. So you, you, you see something which is, again, multidimensional and uh, quite, uh, quite important. Now, uh, I don't want to elaborate much more because I'm very close to the end <laughs> of this first introductory exposition, uh, but I would uh, make a plea for having 10 minutes more. Granted? Thank you so much. So, uh, a very important point is the definition of price stability. Again, coming out of the crisis, in the crisis, in a situation where we were profoundly divided, because you had some uh, very important uh, central banks not giving any precision on what they were calling price stability. 
And that was in particular the case of the United States of America. The Fed was not mentioning uh, any uh, definition of price stability or any target in terms of uh, inflation, medium term. The Japan was uh, not giving any such uh, target. We had the ECB from the very beginning mentioning that uh, inflation uh, should be below 2% at the very creation of the ECB. And then to avoid any misunderstanding, in 2003, we uh, make, made the, the, the precision that it would be less than 2, but close to 2. <coughs> And it was to avoid the idea that we were mentioning less than two, so it meant from zero to two. From zero to two would mean average one. And so there was some kind of uh, understanding that we thought wa was totally wrong and not, not in line at all with what we were, uh, I would say, aiming at, which was that we were, as a matter of fact, be an inflation targeter of 1%. So it was not the case. The inflation expectations medium term since the very beginning of the setting up of the euro were at the level of approximately 1.75, 1.8%, so less than two, but close to two. And uh, uh, of course, the market and the observ observers in general, the market participants, understood pretty well, it seems to me, and academia, that when we were saying less than two, but close to two, it was meaning something like, as an average over the medium long term, say medium term, not to complicate, uh, of 1.8, 1.9, 1.75, or something like that, which was in line, again, with, with the um, uh, computation of the inflation expectations that uh, we had uh, observed since the very beginning. In the crisis, because of the crisis, the two major central banks, because when you count the US, it is the number one country uh, in, the, in the advanced economic constituency. If you take Japan, which is twice as big as, as Germany, it's a very important uh, country too. Both decided to join us and to mention 2% in their overall definition of price stability or target or goal, or you name it. And uh, so that it means that at the moment I'm speaking, the four currencies issued by the four uh, central banks that are uh, in the big, uh, I would say, advanced economy and are the currencies in the basket of the SDR, the special drawing rights, those four currencies, the, the fifth currency, as you know, is the renminbi, the, the Chinese renminbi. So the, those four currencies have the same definition of price stability, or are all mentioning 2% as uh, the uh, uh, figure that they are mentioning when they, they uh, mention their goal, their inflation goal. Of course, medium term. Don't never forget, it is medium term. They are all reasoning me medium term. Even the inflation targeter of the very beginning have understood that you cannot reason on the, on the basis of 18 months or two years, but you have to reason uh, in terms of stabilizing inflation expectations in a medium-term perspective. So, uh, as you see, uh, uh, those convergences, in my opinion, are very, very important. I don't suggest that they are definitive. Uh, we, we will see exactly what happens uh, uh, in the long run. Uh, and uh, it would be naive to think that uh, everything now in, uh, with the benefit of the, of the lessons of the crisis. And as you, as you could see, in all cases, the immediate benefit of the lessons, because, because it was not a long time after the, the crisis, but it was in the, uh, I would say, unfolding of the crisis that most of these decisions were, uh, or decisions or behavior were observed or taken. So uh, I think really that there is something there which is more important than is usually uh, considered, and uh, that which, which uh, calls, by the way, for more attention by academia, if I may say that, to the professors and future professors that are uh, that are in this room, because I, I, I really take it that uh, that it is important. As I mentioned twice that uh, we I was referring when I refer I was referring to the crisis I was referring to the crisis of the advanced economy and to the extent that there are a number of uh, participants here 
that are coming from emerging countries, uh, from Latin America, but not only Latin America, emerging countries the world over, uh, consider that uh, the recent crisis is in a way the dramatic uh, equivalent of what has happened in the uh, 80s uh, in Latin America or in the uh, 90s uh, in, uh, in Asia. Uh, so that the, in a way uh, the advanced economy thought that they were protected from big financial, economic and financial crisis and it was only the privilege, the sad privilege of the emerging world, but no, it was not the sad privilege of the uh, emerging world and the paradox of the situation that the emerging world that had been heavily touched in the 80s, 90s and even 2000s uh, were protected because they had their own uh, fight against the crisis and uh, their own decisions to redress the situation uh, and they were de facto uh, in the observation uh, that we could make protected from at, at least at the very beginning. Then, then they were touched, of course, by the uh, global unfolding and the uh, uh, drama which was created by the fact that the m most important economies in the world were um, in such a situation. So I have only now four minutes left, uh, uh, Madame. And so uh, I will consider that the success of the euro would be uh, for, uh, for question and answers, but still, success of the euro. And I know that you have read the country and uh, that many, many articles, observers, uh, uh, not, not many, I would say, uh, uh, academic articles, because they are more nuanced uh, generally, but ma many articles uh, in the public debate are very negative. So first, when we created the euro, we were told this currency will not fly. That's very simple. You are mixing up the DM, the Gilder, a number of other currencies that have a great level of confidence and of creditworthiness, if I may, but also with the drachma, the excudo, the, uh, the peseta that have no such, uh, uh, I would say, pedigree. So, cannot work. It will not be a credible currency. It will not be a, a currency uh, keeping its value over time, and it will uh, it will not hold. Simple as that. And I, I can testify that it was what I heard a lot of time at the very very beginning. What happened, as you know, the euro is there, solid, credible currencies, and uh, very often the, cri the, the the critics of the euro were suggesting, which was perhaps true from time to time, that it was too high, too elevated in the exchange markets, which is extremely paradoxical for a currency which was supposed to be non-credible. Second uh, observation, I was very told, uh, very often told, in the crisis you will not hold. This is the worst crisis ever since World War II. How could you imagine that a currency st starting from scratch only a few years ago, when we all have to cope with this drama, would hold. And again, I responded or already had to, to the uh, uh, argument uh, when speaking of the euro as a currency. But speaking of the euro area as an entity, uh, let me only say, and I don't uh, go further, that we were at the very moment of the crisis of uh, Lehman Brothers, so the very peak of the uh, f financial crisis, we were 15 countries in the euro area. I remember I was there. By the way, we started with 11 and then 12 with Greece, and then three countries entered in my own time in the euro area, so we were from 12 to 15, which is quite impressive because you, you see history in the making there. Huh? I was president of the ECB, and in ap approximately four years' time, I could accept four, uh, three new countries in 12 up to 15. Then, how many countries entered in the euro area after the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, in your opinion? Who, who knows? 
who knows how many more countries entered in the euro area after the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. I'm surprised you should know. Four. Four countries. And we are today 19. 19. So to those who, who uh, were uh, arguing, you will not hold, the euro area will evaporate, the German will go back to GM, the Greek uh, will uh, get out of the euro area because austerity is uh, not, I would say, to be, to be accepted by the people. At the very moment I was told that, we could see a, a major augmentation of the size of the euro area. You see, it means something in terms of resilience, say resilience. Now, I have zero minutes now, so only a few seconds. So let me only say that the European people, according to the Eurobarometer, supports the euro with a significant majority in all euro area countries which is something which was also not expected. And let me finally say that when you compute, and I, I would rely upon you because, because uh, methodology plays an important part, but according to what I see in the IMF figures and the World Bank figures, the growth per capita of the euro area since the setting up of the euro is not different from the growth per capita in the United States of America which is perhaps as surprising as uh, the expansion of the euro area in a period of crisis, because it's not what you have read. You have read, of course, uh, the US is a success and the euro area is a failure. It is true when you look at the absolute magnitude of uh, the growth, uh, but uh, you have to take into account demographics, and it's clear that uh, demography is less dynamic, of course, in Europe in comparison with the United States of America. And that, of course, explains why we, had, uh, we, we might have uh, approximately the same board. I'm not satisfied with all that. Uh, we are not living in a satisfactory world. We have to do a lot of things to improve the situation. It's not very good to say, well, we grow uh, per capita at the same pace as the United States, because the absolute level of our standard of living is below the, the United States by far, more than 30%. So we should catch up. And we do not, we did not, at least since the setting up of the euro. And I could say a number of other things that are important to nuance a little bit what I said as regards the success, because we have also issues that are associated with inequalities between countries, be, be, uh, with, uh, with the convergence or absence of sufficient convergence between the various countries, with a big success, by the way, of the newcomers in the euro area and less of a success for the uh, core uh, at the very beginning, the, 12, the 11 and then 12 at the very beginning. So as you see, I stop there. I will respond to all questions on what I have said and also on the future and what should be done to uh, improve the situation. As I said, we should not rest on our laurels. We have a lot to do. Thank you very much for your attention. very much for this uh, presentation. After you reflected on the importance of the euro and the multidimensionality of monetary policy in the European Union or the European Monetary Union, we would like to reflect on the multidimensional, multidimensions of central banks today, as this was our topic. Therefore, the three of us, so Francesco, Louis and I, will talk about um, different aspects that have come to our mind. The first one will be enlarging scopes, talking about financial stability, which will be my part. Thereafter, Louis will talk about the macro stability and macro policy and its interactions with central banks. And finally, Francesco will um, reflect on the linkages between democratic legitimacy and central banks. So when we reflect on today's topic, it is very certain that central banks operate in a different environment than they did 10 years ago. As he pointed out, we are in a world of unconventional monetary policy and greater significance of finance, meaning financial regulation is more important than financial supervision. The thought on the topic, when I think of financial stability and the role for central banks, are the question, what role does the central bank have with regards to 
safeguarding financial stability, preventing financial crisis, and managing financial crisis. And since the second two points are inherently linked to financial stability, I will first go on to the concept of financial stability. So up until today, there is no consensus on how we will define financial stability. The only consensus is that financial stability means that the financial sector is able to fully fulfill its function and to support economic growth. Whereas the first aspect, meaning that the financial sector is able to fulfill its function, is the link to monetary policy, because we see that the financial system and the monetary system are intimately intertwined and mutually relying on each other. So this is where we have the link to the central bank and then the implication of central banks, and you also pointed that out in your presentation. Since the last financial crisis, financial stability, the concept, has experienced a great revision, and not only the concept itself, but also the mechanisms how we assess financial stability today. Accordingly, we're perceiving and, totally, and assessing financial stability totally different. Before the financial crisis, we considered financial stability from a micro aspect, looking at individual agents, mainly banks. The advantage today is that we understand the multi-dimensions of financial stability and its systemic components and the possibility of financial instability <coughs> evolving endogenously. And we understand today that financial stability can be way bigger than the sum of the individual risks. This has also gone along with the adoption of alternative concepts to the mainstream. I'm speaking here, for example, Minsky and Kindleberger, which Mr. Borio or yourself have used a lot. So we have in certain sense, or the standard theory has come to understand that finance matters and money matters. And you have pointed that also out in your text. The issue, however, is that these new concepts that the standard theory adopted still use the old explanatory approaches meaning it still externalities, imbalances, and asymmetric information. And although we understand today that financial stability can evolve endogenously, it is still in the end the idea that we have the unraveling of imbalances and the repricing of risk. And you have pointed it out yourself, you've talked about systemic risk and the importance of systemic risk as using it as a synonym for financial instability, which kind of goes with the sensation that we can measure it and that we can prevent it by just correctly internalizing externalities. And from my point of view, that is something fundamentally different to what Minsky, for example, had in mind when he talked about financial stability. Minsky had something way bigger in mind than externalities. In a certain sense, an intangible dimension of finance, something that we cannot measure. Why he, this is why he used the concept of fragility and vulnerability. It is something we can way more difficult to distinguish from stability, so stability and instability. Because it's also linked to fundamental uncertainty, for example, in the post-Keynesian sense. So following this idea of Minsky, for example, we have to accept at one point that crises are inherent to the system and that they're recurring and that they have a meta dimension which we cannot get rid of by correctly diversifying risk or internalizing externalities. So the question I would have to you is, how do we deal with a financial system in which we have financial actors that are at the same time subject and source of financial instability? And how do we grasp this intangible dimension of finance? And how can we accordingly prevent financial crisis as long as possible? Because at one point we have to accept that our prevention is exhaustive. Yeah. Which leads me to my second point. If we accept that financial stability can just be guaranteed up to a certain point, it is highly important to have a correct crisis management. And after the crisis, there have been a lot of re-regulations and a lot of institution building. I'm, for example, pointing out the banking union with the single supervision mechanism or the single resolution board. However, the European Union has a lot of deficiency up until today. For example, we still have no deposit insurance, we have no budget, and it's frequently called into question whether the balance will work out. And most importantly, the European Union does not have a safe and liquid asset. So if we would come again to a vicious cycle between banks and the sovereigns, we would have no crisis management tool to prevent it. For at this moment, it is the German bond that is the highly liquid and quasi non-defaulting asset that banks are using as collateral always. And to make up for this, the European Commission has proposed the sovereign bond back securities proposal. I'm sure you are aware of it. And it's this idea of creating the safe and liquid asset without infringing in government financing. Apart from a lot of deficiency, of which I'm sure you're 
have had multiple discussions and I'd be very happy to embark on. The biggest problem with the SPBS proposal is, however, that the safety and liquidity of the asset in the end depends on the treatment of the asset by central banks. So meaning, if we don't have a lender of last resort, in the end of the day, it will not be a safe and liquid asset. So my question to you is, how do we deal with the trade-off between economic efficiency and political feasibility, seeing that the SPBS proposal is economically not really efficient, but it would be very strong and important political signal. So to put it in a nutshell, we see that financial stability, financial crisis prevention, and financial crisis management are all three inherently linked concepts. And we also see that they're intimately tied to monetary policy because we cannot disconnect monetary and financial questions. So why does the ECB still have a single mandate? Is it because we're in a certain sense still not accepting that up until today that money and finance are at the heart of our economy? And then we back to read, sorry. <laughs> okay, so thank you again, for, uh, Mr. Fischer, for the presentation. So I talk a bit about um, some reflections I had on, first, your notion of convergence within the Eurozone, and what does it say for a macroeconomic policy, more specifically for uh, some kind of policy mix in the Eurozone uh, in the future. So just uh, very quickly, because we're in the of time, I just uh, created this graph here that plots the standard deviation in some macro indicators uh, over time. So the gray line is the standard error in terms of core inflation uh, growth rates. So you can see that they, are, they somehow converge close to zero. So that's the left hand axis. So we had some kind of convergence in terms of inflation rates. And as you said, we had some kind of convergence in terms of growth, that kind of things. My point is that with that kind of indicators, we're looking at averages and we're looking and we're forgetting about some other indicators that may be of importance. The uh, reddish line is the growth rate, there's no deviation in house price inflation, real house price index. You can see that despite a small decrease, it remains around six, five, six points in terms of standard error, standard deviation. So we had significantly different uh, house, house, house price inflation within the Eurozone. And the dashed line that you can read on the right hand axis is basically the level of these house prices uh, in terms of standard errors. So in terms of convergence, my point would be maybe in aggregate, maybe looking at some macro indicators, not all of them. And on the benefits that you mentioned in some of your articles, uh, that's the, the average that's destination, I mean, the average destination of the German export basket in the 2010s. And you can, and the rate of change between 2010 and 2016. And you can readily see that you have a negative change towards the Eurozone and a positive change towards the Asian markets, namely China and anglo saxon countries, namely uh, the UK and the US. So my point is, is that you have two, the bottom line is that you have two types of countries and here I'm building heavily on the framework built by Albert Stockhammer, uh, namely that uh, you have two types of countries in the, uh, in the Eurozone, namely debt-led and export-led countries. Export-led countries being able to redirect their exports orientations if they are uh, in dire straits, and that's the case in Nigel Germany. And so we can't really talk about, I mean, in the 2010s, we can't really talk about benefits from the Eurozone because the growth of these countries was driven by uh, growth outside of the Eurozone, namely the recovery uh, in China and the US. And so you have a whole literature, I won't delve too much into details, about structural imbalances within the Eurozone with uh, articles by uh, Professor Jacques Bazier and Bastien Petit here and the very nice article by Storm and Nash uh, in 2015 about uh, financial inflows, uh, flows imbalances. Um, so my point is strongly is that we have strong heterogeneity be, uh, facing uh, in the Eurozone and so will one size fit everyone? And so the first question so regarding uh, recent news is can we really stop QE? Because regarding the recent trends we have three, again, different types of countries. We have a bunch of countries, namely Austria, Germany, and so on, with roughly high inflation, uh, 2.4 in Germany, sick. And uh, Portugal, Italy, Greece, France, low inflation, low growth, and some kind of middle ground with Spain. Uh, is dropping QE right now adequate 
First, given that we have somehow housing bubble in Berlin starting, say, similar thing happening again in the Netherlands, um, should we not try to still sustain prices in the south? Because given recent outlook, uh, with, I mean, inflation in the south is decreasing significantly. Um, and amongst conventional tools, what, do, what can we do? Because we can't really rely on different interest rates across the Eurozone. So I just wanted to ask you what you thought about some proposals made, for instance, by Paul de Grauer about country-based reserve requirements uh, in order to have some, dif to tack you know, to tackle heterogeneity, and all asset-based reserve requirements that could somehow overlap, uh, and so on and so forth. So my conclusion is that we can't really talk about convergence in terms of structure. We cannot really, we're not very armed for having uh, a monetary policy in face of heterogeneity. So my point is, my question is, should we throw the baby with the bathwater? Namely, should we go for no euro at all, exit back to national? That's not my view, absolutely not. A lot of people, I mean, many people that we've had here, for instance, would defend that, but I'm not, I'm not totally, uh, I'm totally against that. Because I totally agree with you that we need some degree of federalism, but that would go further than you. That's, uh, on these graphs, that will be very quick, because we're in a lot of time. This is a model set by DVK Mazin Saadawi, who uh, model explicitly the existence either of a Europe, uh, federal budget, or euro bonds for counter-cyclical policies. And they uh, somewhat simulate some kind of supply shock. And as you can see, uh, without federal budgets, we are very low. With a federal budget, we are relatively high. Um, and then I won't, I will just mention in this respect that we need to somehow maybe to redefine the policy mix because we said that we have to adapt monetary policy stances to structural data in, uh, in economies, uh, but uh, it's more than different data. I mean, the Eurozone is a very strange animal in many respects, and the structural imbalances are maybe even more severe than in the US. And so I would go, for instance, federal, we, maybe we should need a federal budget with some kind of monetary backing, main, maybe, for instance, for a very strong industrial, proactive policy, not only for counter-cyclical purposes, going th along the lines of people like Giro, for instance, or Piala with the uh, finance climate um, pact. I will leave the ground to Francesco for some comments on democracy. Well, thank you again for your presentation. I will touch about uh, the future perspective and in particular um, on your proposal for a political and economic federation by exception that would consist in uh, replacing the fines connected to the FGP and MIP uh, that proved ineffective with uh, a mechanism of substitution of the European Commission to the government of the country in question. And so the European Commission would act uh, temporarily as a, a federal government and take the appropriate decision on behalf of the irresponsible country. And according to you, this uh, uh, mechanism uh, would uh, pass the five necessary requirements that you retain essential for advancing in the direction of uh, an economic and fiscal federation, and namely would be uh, bold, would be operational, meeting the subsidiary principle, effective and democratic. So uh, what I will try to discuss is uh, if this is enough for uh, legitimizing the shift uh, of the budgetary sovereignty uh, to the European level. And I think this is uh, a particularly relevant question if we uh, take into account, especially in the French debate, that the rejection of the European constitution seemed to prove that the uh, rhetoric of democracy doesn't necessarily work uh, in aligning the uh, people expectation with the uh, European uh, project. So uh, to analyze this uh, proposal, I will uh, record to uh, two concepts of legitimacy uh, utilized by the scholars uh, studying the European Union, namely the input legitimacy that concerns the government by people and stress a rhetoric of participation and consensus but also need a belief in a collective identity to avoid the threatening character of the majority vote. And we have this kind of uh, leverage on this kind of legitimacy uh, several times in the discursive history of Europe, with the settlement of the European Parliament, the Union citizenship and transparency and the subsidiarity. 
And the second one would be uh, the output legitimacy. So the government, 40 people, that would legitimize a, a political decision if this effectively promotes the common welfare of the uh, constituents in question. And again, this was the case of the single market and the EMU and uh, the support of the shared uh, European interests. So as Sharp says uh, in this quote, uh, democracy would be an empty ritual if the political choices of governments were uh, not able to achieve a high degree of effectiveness in achieving the goals and avoiding the dangers that citizens collectively care about. So, how to raise the necessary legitimacy uh, with this mechanism that uh, you propose? So, from the point of view of the, of the input legitimacy, uh, maybe the last word of the parliament might be not enough, if we see a generalized decline in the confidence in the traditional institutions of representative democracy and also the structural uh, limitations that concern the extension of a model of popular sovereignty based on party government that sweeps more the national level than the European uh, one. But also, and maybe mainly, from the output legitimacy point of view, I would say that this mechanism is, is still based uh, on a rationale of rule-based fiscal uh, coordination. And so we still have the limitation of such coordination that needs to be overcome. And here I refer to the old debate between like rule-based policy and discretional policy and their capability to face future uncertainty. And also we should uh, consider the rising concerns for possible amplifying effect of austerity policies uh, uh, on recessions, and especially the case where like household debt is above the long-term average. And so the opportunity for the center to raise the necessary legitimacy and operate on behalf of the world economy uh, and the monetary union might be restricted by this consideration. And so I was wondering uh, which other mechanism to legitimate the uh, sovereignty sharing, and if you can spend a few words more, maybe on uh, <coughs> something you mentioned in your text, that would be uh, a commission that brings together the European Parliament and some committees of the national uh, parliaments. Yes, yeah, so um, we're done with our presentation, sorry for being a bit over time, so we're not quite as good as you were. <laughs> Um, we will now give you the time to respond to our questions, which we have put together here once more. And thereafter, we will then engage in the dialogue with the students. For the students, we will always take three questions at the time, if that's okay for you. So that you yeah, can... Yeah, yeah. And um, just to inform the students, female speakers will be put up higher on the list, because we would like to encourage our female colleagues. Maybe I will uh, I will be there because I will see the questions and be sure that I am not missing some questions, if you permit. So, uh, how many minutes are, are you giving me? I don't remember. Take your time. As long as, long as you like. Oh, really? Yes. Be, be, <laughs> be prudent. <laughs> okay. So, uh, on financial stability, so the first questions uh, that you you have addressed. Uh, let, me, let me say that, uh, first of all, I did not mention Minsky and uh, other luminaries, which, uh, in my uh, understanding, were absolutely essential mm -hmm. to understand the crisis and were uh, badly forgotten before the crisis, uh, because I did not elaborate on the cause of the crisis, which I had done before. But uh, taking into account the limited time I had, I decided not to do, do that. But uh, it is absolutely clear in my understanding that the analysis of uh, Minsky are absolutely fundamental. And uh, even if you, you said we have to overpass Minsky and go further, and, uh, which I accept fully. Uh, that being said, my understanding of the uh, way the central banks, uh, because we are uh, on uh, an issue which is uh, what 
are the responsibilities of, and the instruments that the central bank can utilize in order to prevent financial instability, uh, deal with financial instability when it uh, it is uh, it is there, and uh, and certainly uh, manage uh, the situations. I would say uh, first that the monetary policy itself has to be wise, and it's easy to say and much more difficult to perform. I am very happy that we have a large consensus now to consider that we have to take into account the dynamics of uh, credit, the absolute level of uh, uh, debt outstanding, public and private, and the dynamics of credit as integral part of the meditation of a central bank which has to take decisions. Only to stick to the, um, I would say, expectations of, uh, or anticipations of inflation and uh, stick to inflation targeting proved dramatically wrong. That does not mean that it is very easy to incorporate the so-called, I would say, uh, financial stability uh, analysis. But in my understanding, and I think that there, there are a lot of good academic work on that, if you miss totally the uh, perception that when the crisis occurs, either you have a dramatic threat of deflation, which is dramatic from the central bank responsibility of price stability, or possibly a dramatic threat of inflation, if uh, in particular you have the, the uh, debt outstanding, instead of creating a, a dramatic shrinking, which is generally the case in the private sector, but uh, if you are in a, uh, on the public sector side, you could have an, an augmentation of inflation, which could equally be dramatic. So there is a link probably a longer-term link between, again, preventing financial instability, not only for the sake of preventing financial instability, but also because it's associated with the core responsibility. I remain of the opinion, of the opinion that the core responsibility of a central bank is long-term price stability, medium and long-term, but with a special dedication for long-term. That's a first, I would say, uh, comment I would do. Uh, I would insist very, very much on the macro prudentials. It's absolutely clear that the idea that a lot had to be done in the macro prudential domain, the, the, the loss of this perspective before the crisis was very dramatic. Perhaps the loss of this perspective now is equally dramatic. It seems to me that there are elements of credit dynamic in many countries and at the global level, which would call for the utilization not of the monetary policy instrument, but, but of the macro prudential instrument, on top of the new responsibilities of many central banks in micro prudentials. And there, of course, it could open an immense chapter of where, who is the ultimate re responsible for macro prudentials. They are in some countries, uh, a, a big responsibility, big responsibility of the of the central bank in terms of macro credentials. In others, the central bank is giving advice and has not the direct responsibility of macro credentials. But I would, I think that this is a domain which is absolutely essential because there you have instruments. We don't know yet, uh, by the way, uh, how they would function, whether they would be efficient. But it seems to me that there is a consensus. Whatever is the ultimate, uh, the entity which is ultimately responsible, it seems to me that it is extremely, extremely important. Other, um, um, I would say, uh, reflections or comment. Of course, as I said, that it was very important that the central bank would have the best monetary policy possible and not embark on taking abnormal risks, and that can happen any time. I can give you my own example as a central banker. Any decision taken, both ex ante and ex post, is triggering 10 times more call to the central banks to be expansionist, not to augment rates, 
Uh, or, uh, or not to, dimin to, uh, to augment rates uh, when, when you are at a certain level, or uh, uh, to diminish rates uh, uh, when, when there is uh, a real meditation on whether or not it's advisable to diminish rates. So 10 times more call by governments, by market participants, by everybody, uh, to uh, be on the side, I would say, of laxism instead of being in the side of, I would say, orthodoxy. I make an exception, madame, for the German citizens. There is something in Germany that you know better than I, which makes that in Germany it would be more 60-40, 60, 40, 60 for orthodoxy and 40, only 40 for uh, being expansionist. At least, maybe not in the universities, but in the public opinion. In the Optimistic? It's even worse than that? You, you, what would you say then? 80% orthodoxy? Other German, Other German <laughs> colleagues? Well, they, you all know better. Uh, but uh, frankly speaking, to find in the US or in Japan or in other uh, European countries uh, a balanced set of recommendations to the Central Bank is quasi-impossible. So one has to know that. There is, a, in many, many uh, public opinion, a permanent call for being as expansionist and laxist as possible. So a lack of uh, meditation on a longer term basis. In the long term, when you accumulate laxism, it is the most, uh, I would say, poor pe the poorest people, those who are in the worst possible situation, that are paying the high price. Greece has been catastrophically handled by all sensitivities during years and years and years. The price to be paid at the end was, uh, of course, the, the unemployed, uh, the, the poorest people, those who were in the worst possible situation, because they, they had not a lobby to defend them when the crisis came. So it's very, very important to, to reflect on that. Uh, but not only, of course, uh, the central bank has to have a wise policy incorporating the long-term consideration. The governments, the parliaments have also to do that. And so macroeconomic soundness is absolutely essential for, I would say, uh, uh, preventing against financial instability in, uh, in the medium and long run. And that also is something which comes a little bit under the responsibility of the central bank, to the extent that the central bank is entitled to give advice, even if uh, it is not responsible for, uh, for uh, the fiscal policy, or not responsible for structural policies, not responsible for, uh, for what is in the hands, rightly so, of the governments, of the executive branches and of the parliament, still the central bank has the duty, in my understanding, to send messages. And uh, for instance, he, to, to give the message of the, of the central bank, I participated in all our uh, meeting of the uh, uh, Eurogroup since uh, my uh, first uh, appo my, my appointment, and I have to say that I have circulated to all ministers of finance of the Euro area in the Eurogroup the persistent deterioration of the competitive position of some countries months after months after months. It was not the responsibility of the central bank. Central bank was only responsible for the euro and the stability and the euro as a whole uh, and uh, not uh, having any responsibility to give advices to government. Still, we did that and rightly so because, uh, rightly so, unfortunately we did not prevent the crisis, but the crisis was coming really out of these persistent divergences that were dramatic and created financial instability and uh, were a contribution, major contribution to the crisis. So many of your remarks I would, uh, I would uh, be in accord with. Uh, the sovereign bonds and the, the idea to, of having uh, something like uh, uh, the European signature which would be really highly uh, and, uh, and effectively utilized by, uh, by the various uh, commercial banks and uh, is, is a real issue. A lot of uh, meditation have taken place. You probably have read the paper which had been uh, uh, written 
under the auspices of the European Risk uh, Board. Um, I have to say that this is politically extremely difficult. It is exactly the case where you have uh, uh, very good advices that are very difficult to implement. Uh, in a way, you have already the signature of the uh, of the uh, European, uh, I would say, uh, Euro area signature. It is the paper that are issued by uh, the uh, uh, ESM, the European Stability Mechanism. Uh, potentially, it is an immense institution, which, uh, as you know, has a callable capital of uh, seven hundred and. 2 billion, uh, something like that. So it is the biggest callable capital of a multinational uh, institutions in the world. It, it, it is not known, but the callable capital of the ESM is gigantic. That doesn't mean that it is issuing for the pleasure of creating uh, good, uh, uh, good uh, uh, collateral. Uh, but, but still, it exists already. And of course, you could say the EIB is also, in a way, uh, a European signature which uh, is not to be totally neglected. But the fundamental idea uh, being that you create a new instrument that incorporates the signature of all members of the Euro area and that could be utilized as a, collater a generalized collateral is extremely bold, obviously, and uh, not, very, not very likely to be, to be feasible soon. I understand that I am taking too much time, but you were bold enough to tell me that I had no limit. You should never say that. <laughs> so, so, so I accelerate. Um, convergence in the Euro area. Uh, you say Eurozone generally. I say Euro area. Is, is, it, is, is it some kind? Of, it is the same. Academia does not suggest a particular qualification. Uh, anyway, uh, so I would say that um, one has to understand exactly what happened, which is really dramatic. I will give you only an, a small number of figures. Augmentation of wages and salaries in Euro in, uh, from the very beginning of the uh, Euro up to the start of the dramatic crisis of the sovereign risk. So, say first, from 1st January 99 up to end of December 2009. Augmentation in Euro, so same currency, same purchase, international purchasing power, same international cost. Greece, plus 117%. 117. Ireland, 110%, 110. Approximately, because it, it, I would have to go to my note again, but uh, Portugal, 75%, 75. Uh, Spain, 70, 70. Since the very beginning, uh, they entered at a certain moment, at a certain level, with a certain level of uh, competitiveness uh, overall. It was judge appropriate to enter at that level at the very entry. Germany, stay seated, 20%, 2-0. During the same period, augmentation of wages and salaries uh, in the uh, public sector public, uh, in, in, in uh, I would say, civil, ser civil service. Average of the euro area, 36. And for the French citizen, France, 36. But you see, the experience has demonstrated that something was lacking dramatically in the euro area. You could have, in a single currency area, total absence of correction of dramatic loss of competitiveness or dramatic gains of competitiveness in the same euro area. Until the crisis came, there was not a single year where I could observe. I'm speaking of documents I was given, I was giving to, to, the, to the, the ministers. Uh, so not a single year where the persistent divergences were corrected. 
persistent from day one up to end of 09. And up to end of 09, so it was not the subprime which corrected that, it was not the Lehman Brothers, it was the moment where the uh, sovereign risk crisis exploded. Now we are supposed to look at that, unfortunately in a very complicated manner, which is called the MIP, Macroeconomic Imbalance Procedure. That is supposed to look at divergences, at current account deficits or surpluses, at unit labor cost evolution in order to avoid excessive divergences. I would have preferred myself that you, we would say MIP equal one analysis, very clear analysis of divergences, algebraic divergences, not only of course uh, those who, have, who are going in the in the plus side, but also minus side. So, uh, control of divergences, monitoring of divergences, and recommendations to avoid those divergences or correct them in, uh, in terms of unit labor cost, so cost competitiveness, and in terms of more or less dramatic surpluses or deficit of the current account. I would have been content with that. By the way, it was the two criteria I was utilizing myself. Very unfortunately, I have to say, the, the process created a, a dramatic set of indicators and you don't know too well where you stand uh, at the end of the day. But we are supposed to avoid this kind of things. And that, of course, had created dramatic uh, imbalances uh, and uh, divergences between the countries. So I, I, I'm not of the camp which says Germany will always benefit because Germany has a lot of non-cost advantages. I know because I have observed that, that when we started, Germany had a current account deficit, Germany had a very bad position in terms of in unemployment, and the French citizen, the German citizen will be very surprised. At the very beginning, France was in a better situation than Germany. France had a current account surplus and so forth. But the difference, during the period I have already mentioned, was the German unit labor cost augmented much less than the French unit labor cost. Because the French considered, only to take that example, but many others much more, but the French considered that after all, uh, once the euro was there, uh, there should be a permanent automatic correction. I mean, the market economy should function. And I demonstrated with very sad figures that it was not the case. The market economy does not function as well as was the working assumption. Yeah, 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 no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no, yeah. No, um, but why well, was more or less in uh, Francesco camp there, the, it seems to me, because uh, he was mentioning the divergences between the various countries, if I'm not misled. Am I, am, am I misled? The, I, I, I'm taking you... Oh, I'm sorry, it is the last point. I, I am jumping directly to, yeah, to the last one. Like oh, yeah, no, no, I, 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 I understand. Um, um, we, no, 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 I, uh, okay, I understand that. But as I told you, maybe you took too much of a risk to tell me that I had no limit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, let me, let me go to the... No, my, my understanding, I, I made that proposal a long time ago, I have to say. Uh, I was still full of the dramatic succession of... Uh, happening of the uh, European Council on Greece. And I was telling myself, we cannot work uh, like that. It, it, it is impossible that the rest of the world is looking at us in thinking what will happen exactly. They meet at the level of heads. I was participating in all those meetings of heads uh, uh, in the crisis. And maybe they will have an agreement, maybe not. If not, it's the total catastrophe, Greece leaves, uh, austerity is rejected, and after Greece, which other country will leave, and so forth. And you know that, no, m you might not have the memory of that, but it was very, very pregnant at the global level. Uh, and I understand that pretty well. We had no mechanism to say, well, when there is a disagreement between one particular member and uh, the European institutions, the Commission and the Council, namely the other members, but, but at the level of the executive branches, 
shouldn't we have a procedure to tell as a last word what should be done? And I didn't find myself anything better than the European Parliament, because elected in universal suffrage. I will surprise you, by the way. The European Parliament, according to the Eurobarometer, has more confidence than the average of the uh, national parliaments. Nobody is trusting that. I was uh, asked very nicely by the European Parliament to deliver a speech only a week ago in Strasbourg in front of the plenary of the European Parliament. And I could say, you have more confidence, according to the Eurobarometer, than the national parliament. It, it is v really very striking. I was not expecting that myself, because everybody says the European parliament is made of underdogs. Uh, those who are, cannot be in the national parliament are uh, sent to, to Brussels and so forth. But this idea that you needed more responsibility given to the European parliament perhaps in liaison with the national parliament concern, so that you have a strong parliamentary uh, meditation, if I may. But at the last word, finally, uh, we are in the Euro area, all interconnected much more strongly than we think, and we could see that in the crisis. And uh, the idea that all MPs representing the, uh, European, the Euro area should participate in the ultimate decision, making, you know, maybe a compromise between what is said at the national level and what is said at the institutional level, uh, is something which I trust uh, should be considered. I have no chance of having that uh, applied, that's absolutely clear. There is a, a very timid, uh, I would say, will to proceed in directions which call for changes of treaty. In the crisis, we had two new treaties, the ESM treaty and the Fiscal Compact treaty. But out of a crisis, the hope to have a treaty is very meager. That being said, I maintain that progressively we should have a more democratic way at the level of the euro area to get out of crisis such as the crisis I had mentioned. Of course, what we should do first is to avoid any new crisis of that type in, uh, in, uh, in preventing uh, those crises in the best fashion possible. So we'll stop there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will start with the first round of questions by Yuri, Matthias and Hannah. Um, please raise your hand if you would like to. I will put you on the list and we will organize all those three questions. Okay? So, Yuri? All right. Please oh, speak I up. I don't need the yes. microphone, right? No, you don't need Speak up, you're recorded by Okay. Well, you're not needed? No. No, not no. necessarily, no. It's fine. Okay. Okay, so um, I introduce myself, of course. That's uh, the requirement. Uh, my name is Joram and I study in the option B, macroeconomics and finance. I really want to thank you for I have to say where I'm from. Okay, Germany. Um, Excellent. Thank you for, for this insightful talk and for your time to come here. Mm, you mentioned in, uh, in your presentation in the first part that um, there was an assurance uh, that thought that uh, this crisis would never hit, hit, for example, European countries. And you also mentioned that there was different schools of thought in the ECB, of which you were in the minority which you were in the minority schools of thought that uh, thought inflation targeting with uh, just based on economic, economic analysis wasn't enough. So my question is going in a different direction. Um, I know uh, the ECB is not attached on the head to academia, but my question is uh, what was or is the influence of, of the economic academic circle or of in hindsight maybe sometimes very one-sided theories and methodology on your former work, on decisions of the ECB, on the overall strategy, and um, yeah, maybe based on this, if there's, if you want, to, if there's time, whether you can understand the call for pluralism in the economic academics, or yeah, maybe including alternatives such as Minsky, would have, would that be, would have, have been a good idea? That is the question. Matthias. Uh, yes, you can ask your question. Uh, hello, uh, so, so we have a batch of three questions. I'm from, yes, sir. I'm from Brazil, also from option B, macroeconomics. 
Uh, well, taking what Sophie approached and going a bit beyond, uh, I totally understand that you may see more negative than positive sides on a double mandate from the central bank, but I would like to know uh, more specifically which positive, which benefits you saw the US economy enjoying in relation to the Eurozone regarding having full employment as part of the mandate. Thanks for your presentation. <laughs> okay. Hello, my oh, name pardon. is Hannah. I'm Austrian. I would Austrian. Austrian, yes. Um, I would like to ask you if you could elaborate a bit more about your personal expectations and suggestions for the future political institutional framework. I've read some of the documents <coughs> got distributed, and there are some ideas about um, a federal budget. <coughs> um, also the euro bonds and the one thing that Francesco picked up which is the limitation of this fiscal sovereignty in exceptional cases and if you would still propose these um, for future um, changes and what is actually the feasibility of these um, if these are the same and what should then be done so yes and then there's another batch of the okay good So thank you. <laughs> Impressive. Uh, the sound is excellent here. <laughs> no, really, really, it's exceptional. So first, inflation targeting, academia, pluralism. Uh, of course, uh, a central bank is uh, totally, totally made of PhDs. Uh, in, in the ECB, you have academia is uh, uh, overpresent, uh, uh, of course. And uh, we are totally, totally coupled with, uh, with uh, academia. I would say academia de, at the level of Europe, at the level of the world. I mean, the number of colloquium that we organize with the best, uh, uh, I would say, professors possible uh, is, uh, is very, very numerous. And uh, we have uh, people in the ECB, and we, they, they have now, and we had in my time, that were themselves uh, uh, cheering or uh, totally involved in major uh, economic review of first class, global first class. So, at this question, uh, in, in response is very easy. Th is very easy. That did not prevent us from being isolated in our own concept of monetary policy. As I have to say, we're isolated uh, conceptually the Bundesbank before the ECB and Banque de France, for instance, before the ECB, where we, we had this idea that you should have a look not only at the, I would say, economic analysis, as I said, but also at the overall monetary analysis understood in, as a very complex analysis that would not uh, only concentrate on M3, full stop, uh, but on, you know, the uh, detailed analysis of component and uh, counterparts. So uh, we are, of course, for pluralism by definition. We were ourselves as a central bank, but also full of PhDs of all kind and professors of all kind. We were ourselves uh, expressing pluralism, if I may. Uh, we are not triumphant. Uh, we, we don't say we won. Uh, the crisis proved that we, we were right to, ha to, to, uh, where to, to be more encompassing in terms of analysis than many others. But uh, clearly, clearly, we are for being as bold as possible in multiplying the angle of vision, the angle of analysis, and uh, I have to say myself, uh, I don't know whether I mentioned that in one of the papers, that in the crisis we felt more or less abandoned by the traditional analysis, uh, which was totally uh, dominant, uh, the, the new Keynesian approach, because clearly it was not at all uh, helping us to understand the crisis itself. And it was even not helping us uh, seriously to, uh, during at least nine months, to understand the free fall of our own economy and of the global, of uh, the economy of the other 
advanced economies. So it, it was very surprising, I have to say, all models that we had functioning not only at the level of the ECB but at the level of each national central banks were such that they were giving us, uh, I would say, a band of growth in the quarter that we were analyzing that proved to be totally out of the real growth in that quarter, which was much below, I don't remember exactly how many standard deviation, but it's, it was absolutely extraordinary that we would be out of all analysis that were available, uh, not only, again, in, in the ECB, but also in the National Central Bank's concern, a member of the euro area. Uh, let me uh, turn to the uh, second question coming from a Brazilian citizen. Uh, you know, something has to be said very clearly because I, I am, I'm speaking under the control of the professors. If I am wrong, don't hesitate, tell me. I'm sorry, you're wrong. But we always told uh, in Europe, you're bizarre because you concentrate on only one mandate, but everybody knows that there are uh, several mandates and so forth. Look at the US, why don't you do like the US? But the reality, the conceptual reality is that the US is isolated. What was totally uh, dominant in terms of uh, monetary policy concept, as I already said, was the inflation targeting. Inflation targeting means the, means the central bank is responsible for price stability. And the other political institution, legitimate political institutions, are responsible for the rest. And we don't mix the two. So you should have in mind that the US concept is a little bit isolated. It's, we are not isolated because all the inflation targeters are in the same camp as the ECB. Even if in the ECB we say there is the first mandate, the primary mandate, which is price stability. And of course, that being said, uh, I don't remember exactly the, the word in English. Uh, in French, we would say non obstant uh, le, the price stability. We have to support all the other policies of the, uh, of the European Union. So the, but there is a primary mandate. And of course, I would say both the US and us would say, in any case, there is no contradiction between price stability in the medium and long run, credible price stability, because it gives you also the lowest possible, perhaps, uh, interest rate, market interest rates. And all that being said, normally, it gives you the best, uh, the best, uh, I would say, job creation and growth under the circumstances, namely provided the government has a good uh, structural policy, doesn't make mistakes, uh, has a good uh, fiscal policy, and, and, and. So that, that's my comment on the, this idea, which is, I, uh, I agree uh, fully, uh, very often met and very popular, obviously, because it's one of the domains where uh, you are said, you are told, uh, why don't you do like the US? It works well in the, in the United States of America. I'm not sure it works so well, by the way, in the United States of America. For those of us who, who go often in the United States of America, I, uh, I, I have to say that uh, there are also unemployed people that probably are not really counted. Uh, there are a number of things that we have to have in mind. And also the fact that the US are asking since 30 or 35 years, every year, the rest of the world to finance their lack of, uh, of appropriate savings because they have a current account deficit which is totally structural. So I mentioned that en passant rapidement. But uh, I, I, I don't want to criticize the United States, but again, as I said already, that uh, we, we should replace in a larger context this uh, comparison. Uh, last point, last point, um, political evolution of, the, of Europe. Uh, I already uh, commented on the idea I had to activate something like a federal uh, procedure or a quasi-federal procedure in exceptional cases uh, in order to protect the stability and the cohesion of the area. 
Of course, one could already say the simple fact that you have a stability and growth pact is something which is uh, not, not in conformity with the, uh, fiscal sovereignty. Uh, fiscal sovereignty should mean that you are free to do whatever you want. Uh, you have a single currency, but you are free to do whatever you want. But as you know, the Stability and Growth Pact doesn't say that you are free to do whatever you want. Uh, there are rules, there are recommendations, there are sanctions in the treaty, never utilized, but they exist. So, full sovereignty does not exist anymore in the euro area. We have to be fully aware of that in terms of uh, of uh, fiscal decisions and parliamentary uh, decisions. Uh, so m my, I, I was expanding a little bit the, <laughs> the uh, lack of total sovereignty and uh, I thought that uh, coupling it with the intervention of the uh, member of parliament uh, could, could be appropriate. Now, of course, in the longer run, Nobody knows, uh, Jean Monnet said that very well, nobody knows what will be Europe of tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Uh, I am sure of one thing, we will not be the United States of America because uh, Germany is not Texas and uh, France is not uh, uh, Florida. And, uh, so we, we, we are in historical universe, in cultural universe, that are very different, obviously. Uh, there is no doubt on that. Still, of course, we won't stay as we are because, uh, because it makes no sense, really, uh, in a world which is changing with a tremendous rapidity. And I am uh, calling uh, those here that are coming from the emerging world. I don't know whether we have uh, India represented uh, here or China represented or Brazil is represented. But when you see the rapidity with which India, China, Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, uh, perhaps Vietnam is represented here, I don't know. I mean, all this is absolutely extraordinary. And uh, the Europeans are dwarfing and dwarfing and dwarfing uh, by the day, by, by the year, by uh, uh, the European as well as, uh, as uh, the advanced economy as a whole, the G7 as a whole. When you look at the dwarfing of the G7 in the world, it is absolutely striking. So it seems to me that it goes without saying that uh, the, the European will have to reinforce their uh, political element. Whether it will go first in, uh, I mean, whether the new advances will crystallize in the economic and monetary union or in defense, uh, external and domestic uh, stability, fight against, uh, external and domestic security, I'm sorry, fight against terrorism, um, uh, federal control of the border of uh, the Schengen uh, area or of the Euro area as a whole or the European Union as a whole. All this is open. We don't know. My, my personal feeling is that there is more support at the moment I'm speaking for a joint defense of Europe and a joint uh, uh, control of our domestic and external security and for external control of borders, federal control of borders, more support by the people uh, than for uh, making a jump in, uh, in the EMU. So we'll see. It's a multi, again, a multi-dimensional uh, historical uh, uh, process which is at stake. And um, I, uh, I would only communicate to you my intimate conviction because I could see, see in all circumstances that there is an underlying process in Europe which is very difficult to understand from New York or perhaps from Brasilia or perhaps from, uh, from Hong Kong and Singapore, but which exists and explain why we were so resilient in the crisis when everybody was expecting that we would explode in the crisis. It is this uh, underlying determination, historical determination of the European. They had their own civil wars during 200 or 300 years. And uh, as simple as that, th th that is my understanding, the reason why continental Europe doesn't want uh, to disunite. And of course, I am very, very happy with that, I have to say. 
Sure. Is there, do you have time for another set of questions? Normally we would. Another three. Yeah, I take a new okay. three questions here. Yeah, okay, yeah. Then it is French. monetary policies and uh, specifically uh, quantitative easing and I'd like to ask um, to what extent um, is the distribution or impact of QE through the purchase of uh, bonds which then has effects on the asset prices through the portfolio balance channel of uh, like pension funds for example to what effect to what extent has um, this channel and this effect um, had an effect on wealth inequality because obviously the uh, ownership of financial assets which have been impacted by this channel, um, that the ownership is not uh, equal among households. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Trichy, for your, I think, very insightful presentation. My name is Philip. I'm also from Germany and I study um, uh, in the development policy track of EPOC. And, um, uh, yeah, my, my, my question um, refers to better understanding the, the role of central banks, especially ECB, um, in aligning financial flows with the climate objectives, as has been defined in the Paris Agreement and signed by um, 55 or now 54 countries, um, especially against the background of the inception of the NG um, uh, um, FS, which is the Network for Greening the Financial System, in 2017, which next to the ECB, 17 other central banks uh, participate in. Um, uh, and yes, my, my, my question is what, what role can the, or what new dimension can um, um, uh, a central bank like the ECB uh, um, assume, uh, given that the, uh, the, the situation of, of climate change is, is happening and is real? Um, thank you for some, some words on that. Thank you. Well, my name is Chris, so I'm also from Germany, also oh, from come the on. <laughs> <laughs> also from the development. Very impressive. <laughs> um, basically, I have the exactly same question, so if there is another question on the list, I would also like test, but okay, I can also put oh, this yeah, question. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay, but if the reason wants to go, then go first. Okay, but let's pass it on to the same question. Okay, yeah. um, I'm, I'm Luise, I'm from Austria, from Germany. And I'm also studying on the macroeconomics and finance track. And uh, my question regards the future and my own speculative ideas on what may happen. And on your opinion on that, namely, um, how well is the ECB equipped with dealing with the next financial crisis, which is eventually going to happen, I presume? Um, would it just be the same all over again as we dealt with the with the last major crisis, um, or would it involve other other measures? Also facing the fact that um, what has been done for the previous one led to massive um, well that led to a le decrease in the social acceptance of um, institutions and also contributed, in my perspective, um, to the political events that are happening all over Europe um, lately. So what do you think can be, can be done to, in the case it happens again? We, uh, it's okay? No other questions? Last ones? First of all, thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much because it's, um, it's a very, uh, very, th these questions are all very interesting and stimulating. The problem is that they all, all call for a long <laughs> response and uh, a documented response. So I will go uh, rapidly. First question, uh, distribution uh, consequences of um, QE in general, or more generally perhaps uh, a number of uh, uh, non-conventional measures uh, that uh, uh, were obviously helping uh, assets in general. 
You, you know the response that all central banks will give you, uh, and uh, Mario was very clear on that, as well as Ben and uh, myself. I, I was in a time where we were not purchasing all assets. Uh, uh, as you know, I was targeting uh, particular ones, but I was heavily criticized also for targeting assets in general, even if it was for countries and perhaps even because it was on countries that were in difficulty and, uh, and uh, countering the, the market evolution. The problem, as always, in this domain, and I could have insisted much more in the introductory exposition, is the counterfactual. What you do is what you, what you did. It is a fact. And then, of course, that fact has assets and liabilities associated with it. One liability associated with uh, uh, QE or the equivalent is, as you said, you're pushing up necessarily the uh, securities that you are purchasing. Uh, you are distorting the market because you intervene on the market and spontaneously the market will have put these assets uh, at a, a lower level. And the interest rates associated with these assets at a higher level. So this, this is twofold. Of course, when you say uh, interest rates are lower thanks to the central bank, normally you're applauded. And normally, uh, a lot of people would say, the poorest would say, well, it, it helps us, uh, obviously. But of course, you can take the other side of the coin and say, uh, those who are the owner of these assets, directly or indirectly, are benefiting from it. I would say the, the counterfactual of these uh, non-conventional measures would have been accepting with tranquility something like the 2930s drama, with unemployed people uh, by the million and uh, les queues pour la soupe populaire, uh, the popular, popular food uh, the distribution, or soup distribution uh, for the poorest of the poorest. That was what we had in mind when we decided these unconventional measures, again, of all kinds. And uh, of course, uh, it's very difficult to demonstrate that had we not done that, we, the counterfactual would have been totally dramatic pour les plus démunis et les plus misérables de nos concitoyens, for the most, uh, I would say, vulnerable uh, and the poorest of our uh, fellow citizens. But we profoundly trust that. And that, that is one of the major difficulties of those who are taking decisions in time of dramatic crisis. Because they do all what they can to avoid the dramatic crisis. And then the dramatic crisis doesn't come. And then a lot of people are saying, but yeah, you told us that it could, be, could have been dramatic, but we don't see that it could have been dramatic. And in any case, what you did has uh, uh, counterproductive uh, consequences uh, that are not negligible. So I accept the, 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 the consequences that are bad and negative. I, I accept it. But it is to obtain a, a much more important uh, uh, I would say, result, uh, positive result associated with it. By the way, you can say that for anything that the central bank are doing. You, you could say the central bank uh, has uh, elevated rates. Uh, this is uh, very, very hard for a lot of people that would have hoped uh, to, to be employed and will not, uh, will not have uh, the expectations they had or the materialization of their expectations. Uh, you can say, I mean, you are always taking decisions that are positive uh, from one side and negative from another side, all taken into account. I think we should thank the central bank for the, dec the very bold and swift decision they took in a dramatic period. What, exactly like in the case of Greece I was mentioning, what we have to avoid is to put ourselves in a situation so stupid that we have to take those decisions. And all the advanced economy are responsible for that, of course, uh, as a whole. And uh, it's not surprising that you have this abnormal behavior in Japan, in the UK, you're a UK citizen, in the US and in Europe. We are all culprit 
Uh, mo most of us, uh, <laughs> I don't want to suggest that the German citizens there have the benefit of uh, being in a country which was so wise that they avoided to be themselves put in a dramatic situation. But there, take the case of Germany. Look at the benefit for the German people. They are not satisfied in Germany uh, because the, the same uh, frustration of our fellow citizens exists also uh, in all, all our countries. Still, unemployment did not augment in the crisis. Unemployment did not augment at any time in the crisis in Germany. And uh, of course, uh, in normal times, the Germans are considered bizarre because they are calling permanently for diminishing of spendings, augmentation of, uh, of <laughs> fiscal surplus, and, uh, and, 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 and they don't understand when we are told, telling them you should not accumulate that amount of uh, fiscal surplus, that amount of current account surplus, and so forth. But for the small guy, it is something not to be touched when a dramatic crisis comes uh, in, uh, in the circumstances. So I, I give you that to the meditation of all of us. I don't want to defend Germany in all cases. I mean, uh, I think the 8.5% 8, 8 of current surplus is much too much, and that it is important that uh, uh, Germany uh, would, uh, would uh, you know, have a domestic demand growing much faster uh, and participate more uh, in this respect to the, uh, uh, I would say, diminishing of the uh, imbalances that exist. Uh, by the way, I think that uh, there is a question I did not comment. Uh, I don't remember who made the point. It's very good that inflation in Germany is higher than inflation in the Mediterranean countries. Very, very good, because it means, all taken into account, that Germany is losing part of its overcompetitiveness, because if the inflation in Germany is higher, it means that the unit labor costs, all taken into account, are growing faster. And it is absolutely compulsory for the country with, uh, which have lost their competitiveness in the past to regain it. So, you know, th there are elements that are perhaps a little bit paradoxical in the balancing of the system in a single currency area, but uh, I uh, take advantage of this question uh, uh, to mention that. Now, very, very rapidly, uh, climate change, participation of the central bank. You know, the central bank should participate in everything, in my opinion. Climate change, on the one hand, innovation, creativity, uh, new technology, uh, uh, social equality, uh, fight against inequality. I mean, you, there are a large, large number, of course, of, uh, of uh, common goods that uh, we should participate in. Whether we participate in indirectly in having the best possible monetary policy, in preventing in the best fashion possible against uh, instability in general, financial instability, uh, crisis and so forth, uh, is to be discussed. I, I, I feel, I have to say personally, a little bit uneasy if we embark in fine tuning of such and such common goods, because it seems to me that then it's very difficult to argue that uh, fight against inequality is uh, much less important than uh, climate change or the reverse. Uh, you see, it's very difficult. That being said, there is such a, a collective drama associated with uh, climate change, such a consensus at a global level that this is a global must, that I understand pretty well that there are networks that are in the making and that uh, the ECB would participate uh, actively in that network. Uh, would it mean also that uh, we have to target specifically green bonds, uh, you know, to give them a privilege in, uh, I don't know, in the collateral and so forth? Uh, again, uh, I, <laughs> I must confess, all, all the uh, subtlety of the, of the issue is in, in, the, in the consequences that you are drawing from that. But again, I fully understand the uh, moral participation of the network of the central banks to help uh, what is a must at the global level. Next financial crisis, there will be a next financial crisis. I am very, very unhappy with that. 
but uh, we could not elaborate on that. It's clear that the overall global public and private debt outstanding as a proportion of global GDP continued to augment after the crisis, more or less at the same pace as before the crisis. We were a very few to say that some years ago. The IMF now is saying that. I, I was chairman of the G30 at a time where we were making public that, that and I was very surprised myself to discover that because it was not not uh, in uh, the public debate. So if we do not correct at a global level, uh, only, only to give you, because we are a mix of uh, emerging countries and advanced economies here, uh, the before the crisis, uh, from 2000 to 2008-9, the uh, contribution of the advanced economy to the augmentation of this, uh, I would say, global indebtedness as a proportion of global GDP, 90% was coming from the advanced economy, 10% from the emerging economies. After the crisis, it was not 90-10, but 50-50, meaning that there had been some correction in the advanced economy, not surprisingly, because they were at the epicenter of the crisis. And you had a multiplication by five of the contribution to global indebtedness by the emerging economies. So you see uh, an acceleration of indebtedness in the emerging economy, uh, China be is a being a case in point. And uh, uh, of course, all this is uh, worrying at, uh, at a global level. So we'll see what happens. I fully agree with the idea that a lot of the political problems we have to cope with now are associated with the crisis. The expansion of what we call populism, meaning extreme political sensitivities, right and left, and also extreme behavior, ex extremist behavior, as we could see in the US uh, with uh, the last election uh, uh, and the president, uh, in the UK with Brexit, and in continental Europe with a phenomenon of a diverse nature, including in my country, all this has been probably accelerated, amplified by the crisis. The crisis demonstrated that the establishments uh, of the advanced economy was not able to manage correctly the global, their own economy and the global economy. The loss of confidence has been enormous at a global level. The, the baton of the informal governance of the world came from the G7 to the G20, which was really not only the advanced economy, but now uh, all systemic economies of the world, including all the emerging, the systemic emerging economies. That, that is something which is very, very impressive in terms of loss of confidence in the small group of advanced economy. But in the advanced economy themselves, our own people had lost a loss of confidence in the traditional uh, governmental parties. It's visible everywhere, including in Germany, even if in Germany it's not as catastrophic for the traditional political parties as it is in many other countries, including in mine. But the same phenomenon is visible. So loss of uh, credibility, loss of confidence, loss of creditworthiness, if I may, of the uh, traditional uh, party of uh, government and uh, I hope very much, I have to say, I hope that very profoundly that we won't have to cope with the same kind of crisis because I'm not sure that our own people would forgive twice uh, after having changed governments, after having tried other sensitivities uh, and after having put in a way New, anti new persons and uh, new sensitivities that we are not in government before, uh, if it appears that uh, we have to cope with, again, the same drama, it, we, it won't be forgiven. So we, we all know that democracy is, is at stake there. 
and our uh, conception of values and the, our uh, attachment to values and so forth. So it's very, very grave in a time where we see uh, those values uh, put into question in our own country, I'm speaking of the advanced economy, and some kind of uh, authoritarian, authoritarian uh, international coming from the uh, emerging economies uh, very visibly under our eyes. So uh, th this are, uh, to conclude on a, on a political note, because the question was uh, political. So thank you very, very much indeed. <laughs>